All right, guys, in this week's video, I want to talk about the connection between inflammation and torpor. Torpor is an alternative metabolic state that mammals use when they want to fatten for winter and slow down their metabolism to hibernate. So in my recent videos, I've been talking about a diet I call the glass noodle diet or the optimal omnivore diet. But there are those who have concerns about starch. And the concern is that uh, things like starch, which are not immediately turned into blood glucose can ferment in your gut and this can cause the overgrowth of bacteria and those bacteria can release something called LPS into your bloodstream and that causes an autoimmune response and that causes inflammation and so the argument is to eat simple things uh, like sugar that is easy to digest or very fully cooked starches uh, that digest very quickly and don't lead to fermentation in the gut. I happen to like starch a great deal. It seems to me like a lot of healthy cultures around the world use starch as a base of their diet. So an organizing principle of this video and my blog is the idea that fattening is the biological imperative of the high latitude mammal. Food resources might be scarce in the winter. As winter approaches, you don't store fat, you die. I should also point out, and we'll come back to this later in the video, that the dwarf fat-tailed lemur is a tropical hibernating primate that hibernates through the dry season instead of winter. As winter onsets, hibernating mammals do two very important things. One of them is this increase in an enzyme called SCD1, and SCD1 is an enzyme that adds a double bond to stearic acid. Stearic acid is an 18 carbon saturated fat, and it converts the stearic acid to oleic acid, an 18 carbon monounsaturated fat. In this experiment with Syrian hamsters, this isn't a type of white adipose tissue, which is your normal fat storage. This is a non-hibernating animal here, and what they did was they, they made it cold to stimulate the oncoming of winter, and this is after two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, and then 12 to 15 weeks as torpor onsets, the levels of SCD1 go even higher. The other thing that the hibernating mammals do is they increase the leakiness of their gut. And so this is an experiment of this uh, 3-OMG. This is a type of glucose with a methyl group. So they dissected some of the intestine of the squirrel and they filled it with this uh, methyl glucose and they watched how permeable the intestine is. And you can see from summer to fall, the permeability roughly doubles. And then by the time they're hibernating, uh, it's up roughly threefold. So as winter approaches, the hibernating squirrel is increasing the permeability of their gut and they're increasing SCD1 in their adipose tissue. The thing that gets into the gut after you eat from this increased permeability is called LPS. And LPS is really just kind of gunk that's on the outsides of bacteria. And it's a way that we recognize that signal. And so uh, obviously with the increase in permeability, LPS gets into the arteries. This is the Red here represents uh, the arteries, and this is the capillary bed feeding the adipose tissue. And you can see here I have this LPS contacting a receptor in this fat cell, which has upregulated SCD1 levels. Okay, so step one in fattening for winter is to increase your gut permeability. This is an experiment in mice. These mice here, they gave them a steady infusion of LPS, the gunk that comes from the bacteria that our tissues can recognize as being part of an infection or, or bacterial load. Those mice subjected to LPS got much fatter than normal mice not fed LPS and they didn't take any extra calories to do it. Same amount of calories, much more fatter due to this LPS specifically. And here's how the system works. So LPS triggers a receptor in our cells called TLR4 and we make this in a lot of different tissues. TLR4 activates something called NF-kappa-beta. NF-kappa-beta is a transcription factor, which means it turns on other genes. When the NF-kappa-beta is activated by TLR4 because of the LPS, it moves into the nucleus where it binds to the DNA and it turns on all of these what are called cytokines. And these things control our innate immune system, which is the part of the immune system that doesn't use things like antibodies. This TLR will very generally recognize all kinds of different bacterial infections. Innate immunity works even if you've never been exposed to that specific bacteria before. You don't need antibodies for it. One of the main things that is increased is something called tissue necrosis factor alpha or TNF alpha or sometimes just TNF. If you were wondering why the opening slide had a 
photo of oysters. This is why. This is a great paper showing that oysters have TLR, which in the case of an infection activates NF kappa beta, ultimately resulting in increase in tissue necrosis factor. And the reason that I point this out is this is an ancient, ancient, ancient system. The last common ancestor that was shared between oysters and humans had already evolved TLR, NF kappa beta, and tissue necrosis factor. This goes all the way back to the origins of multicellular life, guys. When TNF is activated, it causes macrophages to release something called CD38 into your bloodstream. And one of the things that CD38 does is as it does its enzymatic job, it breaks down NAD, which of course you get through the vitamin niacin in your food over a 24 hour period, you get about a 20% reduction in NAD plus levels as a result of the tissue necrosis factor. These are mice on a high fat diet who do not have this CD38. And you can see the difference in the NAD plus levels. So if you don't have CD38, you have very high NAD plus availability, you remain lean. And then second thing that the squirrels do is they increase SCD1 levels in their adipose tissues. Why? Okay, so now we're back in C. elegans. C. elegans are a nematode. They live in the dirt. We use them in the lab because they're, they're very simple multicellular organisms to study. Fat six and fat seven are the equivalent of the human SCD, the enzyme that makes monounsaturated fat. These are the things that a nematodes are the equivalent of TNF and IL-6. And you can see the, these red bars down here. The ones that are incapable of making MUFA are also incapable of launching an innate immune response. And they actually die quicker due to infection because without the ability to make oleic acid, you can't increase things like tissue necrosis factor alpha. So now we're in mice, James Natambi strikes again. In mice who can't make SCD1, this is a SCD1 knockout mouse, they don't have the gene to make monounsaturated fat. They have massively lower levels of guess what, TLR4, which is the thing that recognizes the bacterial gunk, right? So what the squirrel is doing is it's increasing the permeability of its intestine, and it's also increasing SCD1, which is gonna increase the ability of its fat tissues to recognize the toxin coming in from the intestine. The system of monounsaturated fat leading to increased expression of inflammatory markers is 600 million years old at least. They further go on to show that in mice, so these are mice on a high fat diet, these are mice that don't make SCD1. And so they have a higher ratio of stearic acid to oleic acid. This dark line here is actually NF kappa beta that has actually gone into the nucleus and is now bound to the DNA and it's activating things like TNF alpha. The mice who can't make oleic acid, the mice who can't make monounsaturated fat, the NF kappa beta never moves into the mitochondria to activate TNF alpha and TNF alpha levels are reduced by about a factor of three. So now we can add to our model of inflammation. What actually happens is SCD1 causes an increase in TLR4. That TLR4 can then recognize the bacterial gunk. That TLR4 will then activate NF kappa beta into the nucleus, which will make tissue necrosis factor alpha. And we could go on to say that the tissue no necrosis factor alpha will activate CD38 and reduce NAD plus levels. And this helps the mammal to fatten for winter. Is this system active in humans? Well, here are middle-aged men, and you can see that CRP concentrations, which is a blood marker of inflammation, were positively associated with estimated SCD1 activity. So in this paper, they took adipose tissue samples, and what they showed is that as stearic acid levels increased, inflammation goes down. So if stearic acid levels are high, that suggests low SCD1 activity. These are the two main ways that we measure SCD1 activity is what are called these desaturase indexes. So if you've got a lot of oleic acid and not much stearic acid, that's an increase in what's called the DI18. And if you look at the 16 carbon fats, it's the same idea. It's the ratio of 16 carbon monounsaturated fat to 16 carbon saturated fat. In both of these cases, you see a strong increase in CRP levels as the desaturase indexes increase, which is to say when SCD1 activity goes up, inflammation goes up, 
in humans. And the same paper, they looked at a genetic variant in the SCD1 locus. And what you see is people who have this AA genotype, you see low levels of stearic acid, high levels of DI18. So that suggests this is a more active variant of the SCD1 gene and inflammation levels increase by about twofold. This study looked at adipose tissue levels and what they showed is that total monounsaturated fat strongly correlates with both SCD1. So that confirms, yes, if you have high expression of SCD1, you'll have more monounsaturated fat. And if you have more monounsaturated fat, you are likely to have higher expression of TLR4, the thing that recognizes the bacterial gunk in the adipose tissue. And so what we're seeing here is an example of creative reuse in biology. If you're an animal and if you're evolving, it is much easier to reuse a pre-existing system than it is to evolve something totally new. You know, the oysters don't really have to store fat to survive winter. That's not really part of their jam. But you can imagine a mammal is now on land. If you move to the north or even a tropical place that has a Mediterranean climate, at certain times of the year, food resources are limited. And so you have to learn to fatten up in anticipation of that food resource limitation. And so what do you do? You already have this immune system built in, which is SCD1 triggering TLR4, triggering TNF-alpha, triggering CD38, which lowers NAD plus levels, which makes you fat. So all you have to do is just reuse that system. It's you just take it off the shelf and you just you just tweak a couple variables, gut permeability and SCD1 and ta-da, you can fatten up for winter too. So what should we do as a strategy? Should we avoid starch on the chance that starch might ferment in our gut and increase the amount of LPS? Or should we try to get out of torpor and fix this whole process? You know, some people are focused on leaky gut and inflammation. Other people are focused on, you know, calories in and calories out. Other people are focused on depression. But if you think about this like an evolutionary biologist, all of these separate issues just become part of this single evolved process. And so I showed you that declining stearic acid in adipose tissue is strongly associated with inflammation. One of the reasons for that is probably this. There is a molecule called steroid ethanolamide. And you can see this is actually a correlation between the amount of stearic acid in your adipose tissue and the amount of this circulating SEA, which is a signaling molecule made from stearic acid. Obviously, as animals fatten for winter, they're reducing this stearic acid, which means they're gonna reduce the amount of circulating SEA. This becomes very consequential. This is a rat that's been fed a certain diet to make it very insulin resistant, and this is tissue necrosis factor alpha, guess what? And so, if you give this rat SEA, steroid ethanolamide, the very thing that the SCD1 decreases, the TNF alpha goes right back down. And so you see that this system is all interconnected. Winter's coming, SCD1 is upregulated, stearic acid levels drop, stearic acid signaling drops, TLR4 increases, gut permeability increases, ta-da, weight gain ensues. This is the biological imperative of the mammal. This is a follow-up paper from that same group, the Hula Lab. So this is actually in tissue culture. They've given these cells in culture LPS, which is the bacterial gunk, and the amount of NF-kappa-beta that's gone into the nucleus to turn on those inflammatory genes increases. However, if they give the cells SEA first, if they give them the steroid ethanolamide first, and then give them the LPS, it blocks that translocation of NF-kappa-beta into the nucleus. This is another inflammatory marker. Again, the LPS increases it. And if you pre-treat the cells with this NSE or the SEA, uh, it prevents the increase in the IL-1B. But what it also does, if you make these rats insulin resistant and then you give them SEA, you see this massive increase in something called IL1RN. And what that does is it actually blocks the receptor for IL1B. And this shows what's happening here. Here's the IL1B receptor. This is an inflammasome, which are inside of your cells and cause inflammation. This IL1B is part of this feedback loop that increases these other factors like tissue necrosis factor that we've talked about in a lot and also IL6, which is involved in inflammation. This IL1RN blocks the receptor 
for the IL-1B, short-circuiting this whole positive feedback loop leading to inflammation. I do sell SEA at fireinabottle.net slash shop if you get some. Of course, it helps me make these videos. Hopefully, it will also reduce your levels of inflammation and this positive feedback loop that is causing your torpid metabolism. I am happy to say that it is now in stock and shipping. Uh, it has been a nightmare getting this last batch, but we've got it now. So this last part of the video, I want to focus on the history of SCD1 expression in Americans. This is the oldest data that we have about stearic acid content of adipose tissues and desaturase index in human adipose tissue. This is from 1943. These are, so these are all cadavers. These are five different cadavers. The ones I have marked in this kind of brown color have low levels of stearic acid and they died of atherosclerosis. These other three did not die of atherosclerosis. And so, in those three humans, their average stearic acid levels was 7.9, and their DI-18 was 5.8, and their DI-16 was 0.24. So all of these things suggest that Americans in 1943 had very low levels of SCD-1 expression and low levels of SCD-1 activity. Jumping ahead, this is 10 different studies done in the early 1960s. In these studies, stearic acid levels have dropped to about five, down from about eight, and the DI-16 goes from 0.24 up to 0.28, and the DI-18 jumps from something around 6 up to about 11. And so already by the early 60s, you're seeing an increase in all of these indicators of SCD-1 activity versus 1943 in what is admittedly a very small sample size in 1943. This is a meta-analysis done in 2008. And so all of these studies come from between 1986 and 2008. And in those studies, average stearic acid levels are down to 3.4. Uh, the DI-18 is up to 12.8 and the DI-16 is up to 0.33. So all of these things indicate a dramatic increase in SCD-1 expression in average Americans between the early 1960s and the relatively recent history. You can see in this chart, there are some outliers like this dot has almost 5% stearic acid, like the historical norm. Well, guess what? That's actually done in French women. Most of these studies are American, but a few are not. Are we sure that this system is intact all the way up to tropical primates from Africa, which gets pretty close to the dawn of humanity? This is the fat-tailed dwarf lemur that lives in Madagascar and hibernates in the tropics through the dry season. Now, look what's happening. Um, this is pre-hibernation in March. This is pre-hibernation in April, of course. This is the Southern Hemisphere, so, so April is right before winter, although this is the tropics. There isn't really winter, but it's before the dry season. DI-16, two months before hibernation, is around 0 0.2. Uh, the month before hibernation is it's really onsetting. Uh, you're up to 0 0.24, so that's a pretty significant increase. Uh, DI-18 also peaks right before hibernation and then the following november so this is the active season this is the equivalent of may in the northern hemisphere di16 is way down to uh, 0.18 and di18 is all the way down to 10.4 in females and so you see that in summer in swimsuit season you see that these hibernating tropical mammals from africa have massively reduced their scd1 expression and these fat tailed dwarf lemurs gain a massive amount of fat in these months. And what they're doing is they're cranking up SCD-1 activity. So to conclude, you know, this whole concept of leaky gut and should we be going out of our way to avoid leaky gut, I think we're focusing on the wrong things. I think we're focusing on symptoms. We need to focus on the greater cause, which is our descent into torpor, our descent into globally upregulated SCD-1 levels. SCD-1 is increasing our innate immune activation. It's increasing TLR4, it's increasing TNF alpha, and it's decreasing steroid ethanolamide. And all of those things together are giving us this systemic inflammation, which is increasing CD38, which macrophages are releasing into your bloodstream to break down your NAD+. Instead of focusing on small differentiations like starch versus sugar, which might have slightly different effects on bacterial gut health, 
I think we should focus more on getting out of torpor and fixing the root problem. All right, guys, that was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I will see you next time.